assume now I am on the screen uh, and uh, <clears throat> good morning, uh, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are to everyone. It gives me great pleasure indeed to serve as a moderator to this uh, webinar. The introduction of the new series of water monographs uh, by our association is a uh, significant, indeed, uh, very significant step forward in the refinement of the current EHR publication strategy. And uh, its inaugural monograph on Andula Boas uh, will be presented today. The author of this monograph is Professor Damian Vailu, who is a senior researcher and engineer at uh, Electricity de France, which is uh, widely known as EDF. Damian also, uh, teaches as a professor at several uh, leading uh, <coughs> engineering universities in Paris. Uh, Damien was a key initiator of this new monograph series, and he has also served as the chair of the EHR new monograph task force that was created shortly after EHR Congress in Panama in uh, 2018, where uh, uh, he was among a few others who proposed this idea and uh, made this idea uh, to be a real life initiative. Following the principle lead by example, Damien prepared the very first in inaugural monograph that uh, will be discussed today. I would like to say a few words about Damien. He is of course a widely known expert and uh, uh, it's widely recognized world leading authority in theoretical and computational with mechanics and also hydraulics. Uh, during his outstanding career, Damien has published six books and over 70 journal papers that have significantly influenced the development of several branches of modern fluid mechanics, uh, particularly uh, smooth particle hydrodynamics. And I would like to show, to show you one of his uh, scientific outcomes. I, I hope you see it. The book that I have on my bookshelf uh, devoted to fluid mechanics and uh, uh, smooth particle hydrodynamics method. It's a fundamental contribution that uh, is um, among key, uh, key contribution in modern fluid mechanics. Uh, in addition to being a very prolific writer of scientific papers and books, Damien uh, has also significantly contributed to the editorial work to help others to publish their work. And uh, in this respect, uh, it's particularly important to mention uh, his service as associate editor for the Journal of Hydraulic Research, where thanks to Damien, uh, high research standards are maintained to make sure that this our flagship journal is flourishing. 
In addition to this type of activities, Damien has supervised numerous PhD students and postdoc, postdocs, and also he, he gave lectures at many summer schools, master classes, and also many uh, invi <coughs> invited talks around the world. He received uh, numerous awards, and among them, I would like to mention uh, one of uh, most prestigious CHI awards, uh, known as the EPEN Award, given to Damien in 2015 for his uh, it's a, a formal statement by HR for his outstanding contributions in the field of fluid mechanics with special emphasis on turbulence modeling for addressing complex real life hydraulics problems. I would like to reiterate that this award is among most prestigious EHR awards and it's given for most outstanding contributions to hydrogen environment research and applications. Uh, in addition to his professional scientific work, uh, engineering work, Damien is also a highly committed EHR member who over many years has extensively contributed to multiple successes of our association, serving at different levels, including membership at EHR council, uh, technical committees, task forces, with uh, his chairmanship of new monograph task force and uh, membership in fluid mechanics committee, as well as his contribution to Journal of Hydraulic Research among his latest commitments. Now, after this brief introduction, uh, Damien will briefly introduce the Water Monograph Initiative as a chair of this task force that will be followed by his presentation and discussion of our first inaugural monograph in this series uh, devoted to Andula Boas. Uh, uh, during presentation, please send your questions that uh, uh, Damien will provide his replies. And uh, at this point, I would like to pass to Damien. And, and Damien will uh, start with the uh, outline of this uh, new publication initiative. Thank you. And I, uh, I hope you will enjoy this uh, webinar. Uh, Damien, uh, now I pass the stage for you, please. Thank you very much, Vlad. Thank you. Uh... I'm very honored and pleased to give uh, this uh, first webinar on, uh, on water monographs. Um, can you confirm that you see me and that you can hear me properly? Yes, yeah, everything looks good. All right. So uh, let me share my screen and uh, show you the web page uh, of IHR's website um, where you can see the uh, new water monograph series. Um, is it correct now, Vlad? You can see my screen with the IHR webpage on the water monographs. All right, thank you. So if you go to this uh, webpage, which is easily accessible from IHR's website, uh, www.iahr.org, um, you can see that um, there is this new water monograph series. In fact, in the past, IHR already published monographs uh, in the form of books. Uh, the most uh, famous of them being uh, mainly, uh, I think, the first one, in fact, uh, Nezu and Nakagawa's uh, monograph on uh, open channel flows. Um, recently, a couple of years ago, IHR decided to go uh, further in this uh, uh, idea of publishing uh, uh, high level and updated scientific work on um, either uh, theoretical fluid mechanics or uh, experimental fluid mechanics, measurement techniques, uh, engineering in the field of uh, fluid mechanics and uh, uh, hydraulics. And we decided to uh, set these uh, new water monographs in a different format uh, getting them accessible, open, uh, open access online. Um, so, so far, we have only one uh, which is published. Uh, the, the task force of water monographs uh, is, uh, is done uh, of seven people, I think, seven or eight, I don't remember exactly. And I'm sharing this, uh, this group. Uh, we have uh, uh, Vlad Nikora as a member of the group as well. And we received a great help uh, from the IHR Madrid office uh, with Estibalis Serrano. So um, as you can see, we have uh, three ongoing projects very close to be published. One on gravel transport measurements in rivers, one on variational waves, and uh, the last of these three uh, on vortex flow intakes. 
these are expected uh, during the, the year 2023, I guess. And we have uh, other projects uh, that are planned for later. We have an agenda with about, uh, I think, uh, uh, 10 to 12 uh, ongoing projects. So if you want to um, have an access to the, to the published monographs, so uh, as I said, so far there is uh, only one, you click here to get uh, my monograph uh, uh, to, to read, uh, and you click to uh, download, and you get a, a link to download the document. Okay, so this was a very fast uh, presentation uh, of the um, monograph, uh, water monograph series. By the way, I can uh, tell you that uh, uh, this monograph uh, on Angela Balls uh, was downloaded uh, more than 660 times uh, in a few months, less than six months. And uh, there is uh, also a um, paperback copy, uh, which is going to be uh, published by IHR, but it will not be given for free. Uh, however, IHR already uh, published uh, two paper copies uh, that are available in an A4 format. It was done for the last uh, IHR uh, Granada Congress. And you can, uh, you can get them. In fact, uh, Estibali Serrano will uh, proceed to a raffle uh, during the, my, my technical uh, speech. So uh, two of uh, the people in the audience will have the pleasure to receive uh, one of these uh, paper copies of my monograph. All right, so um, let me move to my uh, technical presentation now. As uh, evidenced by the title, uh, this is uh, a monograph on the theory of ondular bores. Ondular bores exist in nature in many circumstances. These are uh, dispersive, uh, weakly dispersive uh, nonlinear wave trains. As you can see on, this, on these pictures, uh, they appear, for example, uh, in the case of a tsunami approaching the coast sometimes, or uh, tidal bores, uh, as uh, in this estuary. Um, in fact, it is important to understand that uh, the water level uh, on the right part of this picture is, is less than the water level on the left part. So uh, an ondular bore occurs in place of a hydraulic jump under some circumstances when the fruit number is less than a certain threshold. And uh, it is done of a series of waves, the first one being the highest. The second is a bit uh, smaller than the, the first and so on. You can see on the picture on the bottom right, what happens when you close, the, when you close suddenly gates on the hydraulic dam. Uh, here the dam uh, is uh, far uh, downstream, uh, at the, the back of the picture. And so uh, when you close the gates, uh, an ondular bore propagates upstream of a river. You can see the first wave, the second wave, and so on. Uh, Vlad, could you confirm that you can see uh, my mouse? Uh, we can't hear you, Vlad. Your mic is off. Yes, sorry, Damien, everything looks good and uh, I can see your, your mouth, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Vlad. All right, so um, in the monograph that I'm talking about, I investigate how it is possible to describe these ondular balls uh, using the uh, Kortovec de Vries equation, as it is indicated in the subtitle, uh, which is referred to as KDV in my presentation. There are five parts, and I'm not going to display all of them in this webinar because it's, it would be too long. Uh, those of you who attended my masterclass uh, in the, the Granada Congress last summer have heard about uh, the last three parts. So today, I decided to focus on the first two parts um, and uh, with a, a main focus on the inverse scattering transform, which is a technique uh, to solve the KDV equation and. Uh, and uh, characterize some of the solutions of this equation that are useful to understand the behavior of ondular balls. All right, so this is the first part. Now, uh, here's my notation. This is a vertical section of an ondular ball or a wave train uh, with uh, a water level at rest called H with a lowercase h. 
this capital H denotes uh, the uh, amplitude of the envelope of a wave train, the water surface elevation being denoted by eta. And uh, it is important to uh, remember that all the quantities with a tilde are dimensional quantities, uh, except G. Um, in, in, uh, in the next slides, you will see that I will use dimensionless quantities without a tilde. So um, what are we talking about? Dispersive nonlinear waves means that we have, we have uh, mainly in the, in the case uh, described at the right bottom of this slide. Uh, in fact, when you describe a wave uh, uh, on a certain water level and with a certain amplitude and uh, wavelength, you can build two dimensionless numbers from the different lengths at stake, capital H, lowercase h, and lambda, the wavelength, or if you prefer uh, the wave number K. And these dimensionless numbers uh, are KH and uh, capital H over H. And you have four cases, basically. You know that the shallow water equations or Savonar equations uh, can be used uh, for the non-dispersive case, which means the, the case of long waves where KH is small enough before one. But here in an angular bore, it is not the case. Uh, so the shallow water equations uh, are, are of no help at all. In this case, we have to use uh, three-dimensional wave equations, for example, the Euler equations with a free surface, or uh, depth-integrated equations such as the KDV equations. Uh, but uh, let me explain you how it is so difficult to solve this kind of problem with the Euler equation. In fact, we have um, a free surface. A free surface is free and it is a surface, which means that it is moving and it is a boundary. A moving boundary is something complicated because as a moving uh, quantity, it is uh, dependent on the velocity field within the bulk of the fluid. And as a boundary, it influences the bulk of the fluid through the boundary condition. So there is a strong coupling between uh, the whole mass of the fluid and the interface between uh, water and air. So people imagined uh, to uh, build depth averaging procedures. You can start from a three-dimensional system of equations, for example, or a, a two-dimensional vertical section, integrate with respect to the vertical coordinate Z. Um, integration has the virtue to include the kinematic boundary condition naturally. So you obtain a system of horizontal equations in one or two dimensions where um, the, the elevation is replaced by the water depth, which is an unknown. But you have to make some assumptions, in particular to approximate the pressure term. If you suppose that the pressure is hydrostatic, you get the Savonar equations. But as I said, this is only valid for long waves and we will not uh, consider the case uh, where the uh, pressure is no longer hydrostatic to get the so-called Kortovec de Vries equation. All right, so uh, let's have a look at the dispersion relation of uh, the different equations that we have in the linear regime. Uh, you know that the speed of long waves is the square root of GH. So if you plot it uh, as a dimensionless, in a dimensionless form, it gives you the blue straight line, which is a constant velocity as a function of the wavelength meaning that all the waves uh, propagate at the same speed, uh, irrespective of their wavelength. But if we look at the Euler equation, we have a dispersion relation that is plotted uh, uh, in the black curve, and it corresponds to the formula at the top. So we see that it is uh, not the same picture, it is dispersive. KDV is the red curve and approximates Euler better than Saint-Venant, um, let's say that uh, Saint-Venant or shallow water equations are valid when the wavelength is uh, more than 30 times or 25 times the depth and uh, the KDV equation is valid up to um, or down to a wavelength uh, which is approximately 10 times the, the depth. So for shorter waves or weakly dispersive waves. To build this equation, we consider the uh, Euler 
dispersion relation in the linear regime, and we make a Taylor expansion. So this hyperbolic tangent after Taylor expansion reads like that. And um, we have to uh, truncate this expression. So I simply uh, consider um, the, uh, the ratio omega over k, which is the, the speed of the waves at stake, uh, in the framework moving with uh, the velocity, the background velocity, the velocity in the river. And I'm going to remove the absolute value because I choose to consider only downstream propagating waves. So I assume that omega over k minus u is positive. And I truncate up to the second order, so I keep only uh, these two terms, which gives this equation. And now I'm going to replace uh, uh, omega and k by differential operators going back to the real space, like uh, in quantum mechanics. And we get this equation, which is not really an equation because it is only an operator. Uh, we apply this operator to the free surface elevation. And we get the KDV equation, except that, uh, let, let me uh, explain one thing. In the following, an index will denote a derivative, a partial derivative. So uh, this is the partial derivative of the free surface with respect to time, with respect to x, and the third derivative of uh, the free surface with respect to x. I have added here a, free, um, a, a convection term, advection term. It might seem odd, um, but I will explain it in a couple of minutes. So let's accept uh, this uh, equation as it is. Of course, this is not a demonstration. You'll find a comprehensive demonstration in an appendix of my monograph. We're going to write this equation in the dimensionless form and in a moving frame. So uh, to do that, we uh, choose the following non-dimensionalization, where we use the speed of long waves and the rest water depth to make things dimensionless. And as you can see, we move with the velocity equal to uh, the, the current velocity plus the speed of long waves. Uh, so we are in a moving frame, and we get the following equation with only three terms, because in fact, uh, this uh, moving frame um, is useful because it allows writing the first two term in one term only, this term. So you can see that the last two terms are, um, one is nonlinear, the second one, and the third one is dispersive. It is interesting to look at the ratio between these two terms, and it is called uh, the Ursel number. Well, the Ursel number is an order of magnitude of the ratio between the nonlinearity and the dispersion. When we construct the KDV equation um, with a rigorous demonstration, it can be shown that KDV is valid when nonlinearity and dispersion are weak and when they are of the same order of magnitude. So the Ursel number should be order one. OK, so uh, now what are we going to do with this KDV equation? I would like to explain uh, the origin of the advection term, as I promised. To do that, I'm going to um, remove the dispersion just for a while and go back to the Saint-Venant equation, the shallow water equations, um, in 1D on a flatbed with no source terms. And I'm going to search for solutions where the velocity is a function of the free surface elevation. So I search u as a function of eta. Substituting this into these two equations, you get this couple of equations. For example, um, you can say that um, the time derivative of u is the derivative of u with respect to eta times the time derivative of eta, and so on. And you can see this system of two equations as a linear system where eta t and eta x are the unknowns. Uh, it's a homogeneous linear system. So if you want solutions to exist, the determinant must vanish. If you write this, you get the formula which is at the bottom, and you can integrate it to get u as a function of h. So uh, you probably recognize here the two Riemann invariants 
of uh, the Savonar equations, which means that we are facing uh, simple waves. It is a possible definition of a simple wave in the Savonar equation. These are waves where the velocity is a mere function of the water elevation. Now, um, we can substitute, if, if we look at the downstream prop propagating waves, it means that we have to choose the sign minus uh, here. So u minus two times this square root will be constant everywhere. And we can use it to substitute to eliminate u uh, in one of these two equations to get uh, the following formula. Okay, so uh, it is a very simple formula where we have a time derivative, a space derivative, and we see that uh, the velocity of propagation depends on the water elevation and on the speed of long waves. Uh, we can write it in a dimensionless form using the same dimensionless convention as before. And we obtain the third equation in this slide. And finally, in the case where the nonlinearity is uh, small enough, we can linearize this. Uh, the square root uh, will be approximately equal to one plus one third of eta. So the one cancels out and you get uh, the advection term of uh, the KDV equation. We have neglected the, uh, the dispersion term here and we get in fact what is referred to as the Hopf equation. But you can easily understand that uh, when uh, keeping advection, when keeping uh, dispersion, the addiction term remains the same. So again, this is not a, a rigorous demonstration, but I think it's uh, it's better in a, in a webinar to not give all the, the scientific detail. You can go to the monograph for, for more details. Now, let me explain uh, that there is a family of solution to the KDV equations. And we are going to see that uh, uh, some of these uh, solutions are of particular interest for the angular balls. For this, I need to uh, remind you or to uh, instruct you about uh, the existence of uh, Jacobi's elliptic functions. Uh, these are uh, extensions of the ordinary cosine and sine functions. You can imagine that it plays the same role as cosine and sine uh, in the case where in place of a circle, you have an ellipse. But an ellipse can have a different shape depending on its uh, eccentricity. So we don't have only two functions, but two families of functions that depend on the ordinary variable and a parameter m, which is uh, dependent on the eccentricity of the ellipse. Here's the definition of the elliptic cosine and sine. They are the cosinus and sinus of phi, where phi is the angle such that x is equal to, the, to this integral. It is an implicit definition, and you can uh, plot these functions uh, and obtain the, the graphs that you can see. Uh, these functions are periodic, and they depend on the parameter m. When m is very small, m is always between 0 and 1. Uh, it can be understood by looking at uh, the place of m in the square root. So when it is very close to 0, the elliptic cosine is like an ordinary cosine. And when it is close to 1, it is close to uh, the inverse of the hyperbolic cosine. It gives you the curve in red here. Red corresponds to m equals one. You can see that in, the, in this case, we have only one oscillation. It corresponds to a wave that has an infinite wavelength. Uh, what about the periodicity of these two functions? Well, they are periodic with a period which is four times k of m, where k is defined by this integral. And it is called uh, the uh, first uh, complete elliptic integral. It is plotted here. It is the blue curve. Uh, the, the red curve, uh, the function e, will not be necessary for my talk today. So the, the blue curve shows that the um, periodicity is pi over 2 times 4, which is 2 pi, in fact for uh, small values of m, and it tends to infinity when m goes to 1. So here's uh, the family of solutions to the KDV equations. Without any demonstration, you can uh, do it as an exercise if you want. Uh, substitute that in the KDV equation, and you will see that it satisfies this equation. So it depends on three parameters that are plotted here in red. 
and called alpha, beta, and gamma. These are three arbitrary uh, real numbers. From that, you can define the uh, ground state, uh, the, the lowest energy level, I would say, which is the, the uh, lowest value of the surface elevation. The amplitude, h, that appears here. The wave number, k star. And also m is a function of alpha, beta, and gamma. And the wavelength is calculated from the uh, elliptic integral. So you see that uh, for small values of m, you have uh, linear waves that uh, develop over a quite high water level. And uh, when m, on the contrary, is equal to 1, you have one single wave, which is referred to as a solitary wave. It is an exact solution to the KDV equation. And here, notice that uh, I decided to choose uh, gamma and alpha and to vary beta in order to get several values of m. Um, we are going to focus uh, on the case where m is very close to 1. If it is not really equal to 1, but uh, say 0 0.99, uh, you would, give, uh, would get uh, uh, the kind of waves that you can observe on these pictures. So you can see that these kind of waves exist in the nature. I'm not saying that uh, these are the uh, KDV uh, noidal waves, but uh, they are close to. And uh, the case of a solitary wave also exists in nature, as you can see in this experimental channel. This wave propagates with a constant shape. OK. Um, it is important to remember that such a wave can only exist because you have dispersion and nonlinearity. In particular, with the shallow water equations, it is not possible to have a solitary wave. Let me explain why uh, with a very qualitative explanation. Um, consider children like that walking on a trampoline. Well, the tallest uh, children will walk faster and so they will uh, walk with different velocities. This is uh, frequency dispersion. But the tallest are also the heaviest. And so the trampoline will, uh, will be uh, curved like that. And this curvature, this is the nonlinearity, this curvature attracts the other children so that they all move uh, together. So the wave keeps uh, its shape uh, due to this equilibrium between dispersion and nonlinearity. All right, so now I would like to present the, the so-called inverse scattering transform, which is a technique used to solve the KDV equation. It's a quite complicated matter, so um, I recommend that you concentrate if uh, you want to get it. Uh, I have first to forget KDV and consider, consider a more general problem where you have two equations that depend on two operators called L and A. Each of these operators depend on a function eta, which in the following will be the, the free surface elevation, and they apply to another function which has no particular physical meaning and which is denoted phi. The first equation, as you can see, is just a, a, an eigenvalue problem. And the second one gives the time evolution of phi. What are we going to do with this? Lambda is a complex number, which is unknown so far. We can uh, have a look at the compatibility of these two equations. Uh, is it possible to find solutions to the two equations? So uh, you, what you can do is differentiate the first one with respect to time and see if it works when uh, substituting the second one. So if you differentiate with this with respect to time, you get the following equation. I dropped the dependence of, of L on eta for the sake of uh, simplicity. And now we're going to move uh, this term, lambda phi t, um, to the left and say that phi t is equal to a phi. So we get L a minus a L. So this is the commutator of the two operators A and L, and it is denoted what follows with a square bracket. We see that we have uh, two sufficient conditions of compatibility. If 
the left hand side vanishes and if the second hand side, the right hand side vanishes as well, well, this equation will be satisfied. So the two equations in the initial system will be compatible. But in fact, we will see that only the first of these two conditions is necessary. In a particular case, the case where L is a self-adjoint operator. If it is self-adjoint, it means that uh, lambda is necessary a real number. So what we can do is assume that the first compatibility condition is satisfied and that the first equation of the system is also satisfied. And we will see what happens. So first of all, uh, we take this equation and we differentiate it with time as we did before. Then we play with this, uh, substituting this after some algebra, we can factorize it like that. Now, we don't know that the second equation is satisfied. So we don't know that this is equal to zero. But what we can do is simply to multiply by phi, to take the scalar product by the function phi. So we get lambda t times the square of the modulus of phi as a, a scalar product between phi and the left-hand side of the equation. The scalar product is denoted by uh, these uh, triangular brackets, and it's simply the integral of the product of two functions. Now, remember our assumption at the top of this, uh, of this slide, L is self-adjoint. So is the identity, of course. So L minus lambda here can be moved to the left. And since L minus lambda phi is equal to zero, according to this equation, we obtain zero. And now since phi is an eigenfunction of an operator, it is non-zero. So we can divide by the modulus of phi squared and we obtain lambda t equals zero. This was the second compatibility condition. So we have proved that if the first compatibility condition is valid, and if L is self-adjoint, then the second compatibility condition is valid. So in this case, we have only one compatibility condition. What is the use all, of all this stuff? Let me give you uh, a summary of what we have demonstrated. If we have two linear operators, L and A, L being self-adjoint and a real number lambda, if we consider this set of equations called a Lax system after uh, Peter Lax, they are compatible, compatible with each other if and only if this equation is fulfilled. And in this case, we have demonstrated that, that lambda t is equal to zero. So lambda does not depend on time. So the problem is isospectral. The spectrum of eigenvalues remains constant with time. We say that this set of equation is a lax pair of the third one. And now I'm going to explain what is the use of this uh, to treat the KDV equation. We are going to write a lax pair of the KDV equation. Uh, so we start from these two operators where this is the second derivative with respect to X. This is simply the multiplication by eta. And this is the second one. Uh, we can check that, that uh, L is self-adjoint. Uh, this consists of uh, writing the, uh, the scalar product of phi with L C, and we know that uh, we can uh, move L to the left because uh, uh, we can integrate this uh, by parts twice, and assuming that the functions phi and C cancel out uh, at infinity, uh, we have the self-adjunction property. So uh, the Lax pair reads like that. So you recognize here the first equation, L phi equals um, lambda phi, and the second equation, d phi over dt equals a phi. And the compatibility condition in this case is simply the KDV equation. I give a demonstration of that in my monograph, uh, or you can do it as an exercise uh, to check that you have properly understood what happens uh, behind this. So in fact, uh, this proves that if you want to solve the KDV equation, you can prefer solving the lax pair of equations. That might seem odd because um, the two equations that we obtain are more complicated than the initial one. 
but you can uh, observe that they are both linear with respect to phi and eta. The nonlinearity is hidden in the product of eta with phi here, there, and there. But if we solve these two equations consecutively, we can solve them as linear equations. So this makes it much more uh, relevant and easier uh, than solving directly the KDV equation. Well, um, now let's talk about the uh, inverse scattering transform itself. I'm going to explain it by starting with the linearized KDV equation first. It is called the IRE equation. In fact, you remove the central term and you get a linear equation. You know that you can solve it using the Fourier transform. Take the space Fourier transform, for example, which is denoted F of eta. You obtain an ordinary differential equation that you can solve with respect to time to get an exponential. And then you go back to the ordinary space by taking the inverse Fourier transform. And you see that with inverse Fourier transform, you have now an exponential, which is uh, spotted in green. You can try to remember it because we will see it again in, the, in what follows. But in this case, you have uh, simply one integral to calculate, which can be done using a quadrature method like uh, the Simpsons method, for example. Uh, the important point is here is that you have three steps, going to the Fourier space, solving in time, going back to the ordinary space. And the uh, inverse scattering transform is about the same, but a little bit more complicated. But we have three similar steps. First of all, we take the first equation of the Lax pair. It is, as I said, an eigenvalue equation, so you can solve it. I'm not going to write the solution right now. I'm just giving you the plan. You solve the equation to get uh, phi when the time is equal to zero. And you obtain the spectrum, so the values of the, uh, the eigenvalues. Next, you take the second equation of a lax pair that you can simplify using the first one. Uh, and you can write it like this. If you want to solve it uh, with respect to time, you have to uh, consider only the case where um, you consider very large values of x. So in this case, you know that the free surface and its derivative is going to vanish. And you keep only the term uh, four lambda times uh, the derivative of x of uh, phi with respect to x. So you see that for large values of x downstream of the river, far downstream, you have this uh, behavior. And it gives you uh, a solution, an equivalent uh, expression of phi for large values of x at any time. And the imp important point now is that it is enough to solve the first equation of the lax pair and get back eta at time t knowing only the asymptotic behavior of phi. How can this be done? Well, first of all, this equation is simply the steady Schrodinger equation, where eta plays the role of a potential. Uh, eta of x0 is the initial free surface elevation. So everything happens like uh, if uh, the function phi uh, should uh, pass through the potential determined by this initial water elevation. Then um, you can solve the equation and get the spectrum, which is called the diffusion spectrum at the initial time, because in fact, it's uh, exactly the same problem as in quantum mechanics when a particle diffuses uh, on a target. And on this step, you have, as I said, to assume that uh, uh, the free surface is flat far downstream. And here we use the property that lambda is a constant with time. So uh, the problem is isospectral. So if we know lambda at initial time, it is the same forever. And we get the diffusion spectrum at time t. But we get only uh, the asymptotic behavior of the function phi. And the last step is done using the theory of quantum mechanics. There exists a theorem, the Gelfand-Leviton-Marchenko theorem, 
giving a formula to write the potential if you know the asymptotic behavior of the wave function. I'm going to display all these steps in one example in what follows. Vlad, how much time do I have to finish? Yeah, sorry, uh, you have definitely at least 10 minutes. So okay. just keep going. Looks good. Yeah. It looks 10 good. minutes is enough. All right. Mm -hmm. So we have these three steps, and I'm going to uh, explain them uh, in the, this particular case. Well, let me summarize it first of all. The three steps are summarized here. So you start from the initial condition of the free surface, use the first equation of a lax pair, get the initial spectrum, use the second equation of a lax pair, get the asymptotic behavior of the final spectrum, and use again the first equation of a lax pair to get the final uh, result, which is the elevation uh, of a free surface at any time. So the example uh, I'm going to give is uh, quite simple, but uh, first of all, I would like to remind you some of the properties uh, of uh, the steady Schrodinger equation in quantum mechanics. Um, it is known that uh, the eigenvalues are of two types, um, positive or negative. The positive eigenvalues con uh, consist of a continuous spectrum and they correspond to rapidly decreasing waves, evanescent waves in uh, hydraulics. So we will neglect them in what follows. Uh, they decrease very rapidly uh, with time and space. The negative eigenvalues are the very important one. Uh, they, they belong to a discrete finite spectrum, so I will denote them as minus kappa squared with an index n, uh, which belongs to a finite set of integers. And we will see that each of these eigenvalue corresponds to a soliton. So the result will consist of the superposition of several solitons. Um, also note that uh, a property of the uh, um, Schrodinger equation is that the wave function and its derivatives, uh, its derivative are continuous. This is important for the following. So this is my initial condition. Suppose uh, I have a seism at the bottom of a river. Uh, so the bottom uh, rises suddenly. So I suppose that uh, it, it uh, modifies the initial sea surface elevation like that. It's very schematic, of course. And uh, I call minus L and L the two positions of uh, discontinuity of the initial condition. And the amplitude of this uh, initial step is denoted eta zero. So the first step, you will recognize the steps uh, on the bottom top. The first step is the first uh, uh, equation of a lax pair, the steady Schrodinger equation with the initial spectrum, the one you can see in the picture. And I will consider negative eigenvalues. So uh, you can see that we have three domains. Uh, when x is less than minus l, when it is between minus l and l, and when it is higher than plus l. So we have three cases. And you recognize here um, uh, this equation in these three cases. Uh, so eta is equal to 0 uh, in the first and third cases. And in the central part, we have, uh, of course, uh, the value eta zero. Then I'm going to uh, give a name to eta zero minus kappa n squared. I call it zn squared. So now I can solve these three equations, and it gives me exponentials, of course. We have only uh, the plus sign here and the minus sign there uh, because of the boundary conditions. We don't want the wave to, uh, to diverge. And in the central part, uh, we have uh, two uh, complex exponentials. OK, now we're going to exploit the continuity of phi and its derivative here and there. And this reads like that. We obtain four equations because we have uh, two functions that are continuous at two points. And uh, this gives us a system of four equations with unknowns a, b, f and g, which were uh, the coefficients that we had in the solution that we found. So this uh, is, again, a linear system which is homogeneous. The determinant should vanish, and uh, it gives us the solution. Uh, in these uh, formulas, I use the following definitions. 
taking kappa n when it is multiplied by n, I call it zeta n, and zn multiplied by l, I call it cn. The definition of zn, which is here, remember, shows that you have a link between zeta n and cn. The sum of a square is in fact the Ursel number at the initial time. So as I said, vanishing the determinants of this system gives us the following solution. And we have two possible signs here. Um, depending on the sign, we have two branches for the solution, or two families of branch. Uh, one that I will plot in red, the other one in, in black, it depends on the sign of uh, tangent of C. And graphically, it looks like that. So I plot it here, C. As a reminder, uh, C is defined like that. I plot it here, C, and the uh, Ursel number on the vertical. Suppose that your Ursel number is 100. You see that you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven eigenvalues denoted C1 to C7. Um, and I plot it in red uh, and black, the curves that you have seen before. OK, so this is the way to uh, calculate the eigenvalues. You can count them and see that when uh, the Ursel number is large, the number of eigenvalues, so the number of solitons, is proportional to the square root of the Ursel number. And you can finally calculate the coefficients bn. Let me go back for a while to uh, show you what uh, bn is. In fact, it is um, the coefficient in front of a downstream um, value of phi. So it is important to have the asymptotic behavior of phi for large values of x. It is more or less a transmission coefficient. Uh, so uh, we, we find the uh, following uh, formula by using, in fact, uh, the uh, normalizing condition for the wave function and substituting this in the linear system that you have seen before. So we obtain a function uh, formula like that. Okay. So now, um, step two consists of looking at the uh, asymptotic behavior of phi. We have this equation, remember, and we're going to look uh, at what happens for large values of x so that eta and eta x cancel. So we have this behavior. And uh, of course, uh, we can uh, search now for the uh, value of phi by um, uh, using the separation of variables. So we look to phi as a product of a function of time times a function of x. The function of x is necessarily an exponential due to the uh, equation that we have. And we find that uh, the function uh, of, uh, well, by substituting this in this equation, we find that we have finally uh, this function b of t where bn is the initial value of bn of t. And now, if we come back to uh, this formula, we obtain the asymptotic behavior of phi, and you recognize an exponential that is uh, close to the green exponential that we had uh, in the Fourier transform method that I presented for the linear case. OK, this is the important thing to remember. With that, we can use uh, the gelfand leviton margin close method, which is the third step it consists of writing a function called capital F. It is almost the asymptotic behavior that we found, but Bn is squared. So it gives you this formula. And um, the GLM theorem that I'm not going to demonstrate says that if you find a function K satisfying this equation, you have just to consider uh, the derivative with respect to ace, x, of k of x x, and it gives you the solution, the potential. If we do that uh, in our case, suppose, for example, we have only one eigenvalue. This is the easiest case, one eigenvalue. So uh, this is uh, the function f in that case. We, can, we have to solve this equation, and we can search capital K in this form, and we find k in this form. And using the GLM theorem, we find the following solution. So this is detailed in my monograph. So I'm not going to uh, spend too much time on it. But the important thing is that you recognize uh, a KDV soliton, the hyperbolic second. And we see that its amplitude 
is proportional to the eigenvalue, kappa squared, and its celerity is twice the amplitude in dimensionless form. Okay, uh, if you want to do the same with uh, an arbitrary number of eigenvalues, uh, the, the calculation is done in my monograph, and you get, in fact, uh, something which is quite simple to, to write, but it depends on the log of the determinant of a matrix, the matrix depending on the eigenvalues. Uh, so the computation is not that easy to perform. But an interesting point is that we have this exponential of time. And since the eigenvalues are discrete, they are all different. This means that for large times, um, the different components, the different waves will separate. And we will have a, a free surface elevation that is that behaves as the sum of solitons, each soliton having its own amplitude and celerity, uh, depending on the corresponding eigenvalue. OK, um, in the case of uh, an initial uh, large Person number, we have demonstrated uh, that uh, the maximum uh, value of zeta is equal to uh, the square root of the Ursel number. This gives you the maximum eigenvalue. And finally, you have the following result, which is uh, very important. The maximum amplitude, the amplitude of the maximum, uh, the highest soliton, is twice the height of the initial step. Okay, um, and uh, this is an example with two eigenvalues. I plotted here the results, and we see that uh, indeed uh, the first, which is the tallest, propagates faster than the second one. Um, so that's what we see uh, in this uh, in this formula showing that the solitons separate, is that for large times we have a superposition of solitons. Uh, they interact when they are close to each other, but after that, they continue uh, traveling without changing their shapes. In other words, uh, they, behaves, uh, they, they behave as particles. This is why we call them solitons and not solitary waves. Uh, this means that they can uh, cross each other without being affected. Here's a, a numerical solution of, uh, well, in fact, it's a theoretical solution of uh, KDV. So uh, you can see that indeed uh, they, uh, the two solitons can, can cross each other or collide, if you want, and continue uh, their travel with their individual speed. It is something that is observed in the nature. Look at that. These two solitons cross each other and they continue uh, their route without changing the shape. So uh, this demonstrates that the KDV equation can be solved uh, in a way, uh, although the technique is quite complicated, but again, you'll find some more uh, detail in my monograph. So is the case of uh, many equations uh, that are used uh, to, to describe uh, weakly nonlinear, weakly dispersive waves. But uh, the most important uh, of um, of the equation that uh, we would like to use, the Euler equation, uh, doesn't have such a property. We don't know any uh, system, any method to integrate exactly this equation, unfortunately, although there are solitons in the nature, as, as you have seen. So if you read my monograph, you will see how this can be used uh, to, to get some results uh, regarding angular balls using the so-called Withams modulation theory which leads to uh, uh, gorevich pitayevskys uh, analytical solution. And I apply it to the Favre waves that appear upstream of a dam when closing a gate. Uh, I also added a chapter accounting for uh, the dissipation of energy through uh, what we call uh, the Kortovec de Vries Burgers equation. So that's all for my presentation. I would like to thank uh, the reviewers that uh, helped me in. Uh, coordinating this uh, monograph. And uh, maybe it's time for me uh, to conclude, to say that uh, if you think this is a valuable contribution, you can also contribute. It is uh, possible uh, for anyone to propose um, a monograph to, to this new uh, series of water monographs. Uh, the best thing is to contact myself or uh, any member uh, of the task force. And uh, importantly enough, if you have a sponsor, 
um, it is better because uh, we, we need a small amount of money uh, to, uh, to make uh, the monographs open access. In my case, my employer, EDF, sponsorized, sponsorized uh, my monograph. Um, it is, I think, uh, quite easy to, to find this small amount of money uh, from uh, an industrial because uh, you can uh, make it variable by saying that your company uh, has uh, uh, participated to the, uh, the free accessibility and dissemination of science online. Thank you very much, and I'm ready to uh, answer your questions if you have any. Thank you very much, <coughs> Damien. It was a real enjoyable lecture. Uh, indeed, very stimulating talk. Uh, I'm sure uh, participants of our webinar enjoyed this. Uh, regarding the questions, we at the moment we don't have technical questions. We have one question related to how to download uh, the monograph, and uh, uh, I think uh, Damien covered this issue. And, uh, yes, I uh, covered it, but I can explain it once more yes, if you please. like. Uh -huh. Yeah, of course. Uh, how can I uh, hide this window? Okay, doesn't matter. Okay, if you go to the web page uh, dedicated to the water monographs on IHR's website, uh, you, you can get it from uh, Google by typing uh, IHR water monographs series, and uh, you just have to click on read, and you get this window where you have to click on download. It is it is very easy. I encourage uh, uh, participants to do it. I, I did it uh, uh, a few weeks ago. It was very easy and uh, straightforward and very quickly. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Damien. Another question was about uh, a certificate for participation. And I think uh, our colleague Estibalis from uh, AHR Quarters answered this question. Uh, that uh, uh, so, <clears throat> these certificates will be available uh, on request. Uh, uh, one more question. Uh, no, we don't have more questions here, uh, but we have results of our raffle uh, on monographs. And I would like to, uh, to ask uh, participants who are winners to write directly to EHR publications and uh, uh, to provide the postal addresses. So these monographs, uh, these copies, hard copies of this monograph will be sent to you directly. Uh, Isimalis, would you like to add uh, in this relation about how to communicate or... Isimalis, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, would you like to add uh, in relation to how our winners can uh, can communicate just yes of course um, they can send me a message to publications at iahr.org and the names of the winners uh, i don't know if Vlad, would you like to announce them or yeah please please announce yeah yeah please you 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 were running this so it's uh, it's your privilege to announce our winners please uh, yes, um, excuse me, I, the, the names. Or I can do it, Isabelis, if you wish. Uh, Please do it, because I sent uh, the message to uh -huh. you, and I cannot find him. Okay, so, so we have uh, two winners, and I apologize if my pronunciation uh, will be wrong of names. Uh, our first winner is Augustin Moloko. Uh, and second winner is uh, Chan Cheng. Uh, warm congratulations. And uh, uh, you will receive these books shortly. And uh, I hope you will enjoy uh, the introductory material on the book uh, given by Damien. It was very comprehensive. I, I myself enjoyed a lot this talk and learned also from this. And I'm looking forward actually to, to go through this monograph. I would like to also uh, encourage you to consider uh, uh, presenting your material in the form of this monograph uh, and submit your intentions to Damien and uh, then this uh, task force will consider your uh, proposals. I have one more question I can see. Uh, uh, if you don't mind, I will read it. Salute Damien. Thank you for a very nice and interesting talk. Congratulations on your monograph. A quick question. Can this I 
ST solution, predict solution fissioning and uh, signed by Ben. Uh, I think, uh, uh, Damien, you can see this question. If you please answer. Uh, I'm not sure I understood the end of the question. Solution what? Is it written in the... Predict ah. solution uh, fissioning. What does it mean? F-I-S-S-I-O. Ah, it's Ben. Hi, Ben. Um, soliton fissioning. What do you mean by that, by that Ben? Fissioning. Um, I mean, soliton fissioning. fissioning. Maybe, maybe uh, is it possible that Ben uh, gets uh, the right to, to speak? Can he use his mic to ask a question uh, and explain it in more detail? Pro probably not. Probably this ah. uh, format uh, doesn't allow this. Well, Ben, if you can hear me, I'm afraid I don't really understand what you mean by fissioning. Um, I, I think excuse I can... Me, he's go, allowed to, to speak I can now. hear you. We can hear you. Okay. Yeah, so when a soliton, when some solitons propagate, uh, they're known to fission, which means that they create other small solitons behind them. Oh. I'm wondering if, if this, this technique of solution can, can capture that phenomenon. I don't know, Ben. I don't know. I didn't know that uh, property of solitons. Uh, but I would say that uh, KDV solitons uh, are not supposed to, to have all the properties of real solitons. So um, sorry that I can't uh, give you more detail on that. OK. Oh, well, thank you very much anyway. Now we have one more just uh, complimentary message from Men and Kodua. Uh, just congratulations, Damien. Uh, enjoyable talk. Uh, I, I think Damien wouldn't mind to uh, to answer questions if you send directly questions by email if you have. Although oh yes. We, we need to remember that Damien is uh, overcommitted with multiple tasks uh, in his uh, at his university and also at EDF. And uh, but but I, I know <clears throat> Damien would be very helpful if I need. Uh, I will. And, and I, I do encourage you to download this uh, uh, monograph if you didn't do it uh, uh, until now. It would be a very good addition to your library. And uh, it's also, as uh, Damien had liked it, it's open access and uh, reflect this tendency at EHR to move to open access of all our publications to make sure that they are widely used and uh, uh, this uptake is efficient of our production. Uh, we don't have any more questions. Uh, I would like to thank participants for being with us and uh, I hope you enjoyed, I'm sure you enjoyed this uh, talk and this webinar and uh, I wish everybody all the best. And Damien, if you would like to give a final concluding uh, words and then we can uh, complete our webinar. And, and Isibalis, you also, if you would like to, to give. I guess I have nothing nothing to add, uh, Vlad, except that, again, I was very happy to give this webinar and, uh, and to write this contribution to IHR's portfolio of publications. Yeah. It's very nice. I can see now I realize that Ben is a Professor Roger from Manchester. Uh, it's very nice, uh, 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 Ben, that you participated. Uh, uh, very much appreciated your support. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Yeah. Then I, uh, I would like to conclude and uh, wish everybody a great remaining day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.